This presentation is called Parent-Offspring Conflict and Sibling Rivalry. So in this presentation, we're going to look at parent-offspring conflict and conflict among relatives. And this phrase was coined by Robert Trivers in the early 1970s when Trivers published a number of papers on different dimensions of conflict among relatives. So relatedness, when we first look at it, appears to be this elixir for creating cooperative social life. We noted that relatedness can transform altruism into cooperation. And by the same measure that relatedness can transform selfishness into spite. And this would seem to be like a utopian sort of thing. Just live with your relatives and live in peace. Less selfishness, more cooperation, uh, that might be the model. However, uh, that's short-sighted, as Trivers was quick to point out. There is a zone of conflict uh, very much <laughs> connected to relatedness. My animations are kind of throwing me off. I hope you're doing better with them than I am. So conflict among relatives? Well, uh, we can reduce uh, Trivers' sometimes complex uh, thinking on this to a couple of observations. And the first one is that the fitness value our relatives hold uh, to us varies. So, for example, my sibling has a 50% chance of sharing a gene with me, and that makes my sibling a higher value relative than a cousin. So it's not the case that all of these close relatives around us are of equal closeness, and that suggests that we might be more biased to those who are more close to us rather than those that are more distant, uh, depending on the situation. There are differences among relatives. The second observation seems similar, but it's a little different. And this is that our relatives see things differently than we do as individuals. So it's the same example here, but listen closely. From my perspective, my full sibling is 0.5, 50% chance of sharing a gene with me. But from my cousin's perspective, that same individual only has a 12.5% chance of sharing a gene with them. And this means that the Relatives that we value in different ways aren't valued in the same way by other relatives. And when we put these two observations together, it opens up the possibility of conflicts of interest. So let's try that again and say it more simply. From my perspective, my cousin has a 12.5% probability of sharing a gene identical by descent with me. They're a close relative, but I have closer relatives. However, that same individual from the perspective of their own siblings has a probability of 50% of sharing a gene with them. So they're going to value that same individual more highly than I do. And again, that opens up the gates uh, to conflicts when there are limited resources. So conflict among relatives, well, fitness values vary. We're saying that the values of relatives vary in their fitness. If we add to this that resources are limited, then we're going to find that relatives will not agree on how those limited resources should be allocated. And you can see this if you're ever involved with family in something that involves limited resources. And again, that opens up a zone of conflict. That zone of conflict falls between those varying fitness values and those limited resources, and it can make for very vigorous disputes among close kin. So let's look first at reproductive conflicts between siblings. So here we have purple and blue again and their siblings. And we have this altruistic act uh, by purple. Purple benefits blue, and as a result, purple is harmed. So we've looked at this many times. 
bet. We're going to change the weighting of this just slightly. We're going to say that the cost to purple is one sun and the benefit to blue is one sun. And this is going to change things. So indeed, purple's direct fitness has declined, uh, but what about purple's inclusive fitness? When it's this kind of a trade-off, is altruism transformed into cooperation? Well, let's see. The coefficient of relatedness between these siblings is 0.5. Does relatedness change anything? Well, in this case, the answer is no, it does not. So why is that? Well, let's add it together. We say that inclusive fitness combines direct fitness plus indirect fitness. So our first thing is to tally up the direct fitness cost and benefits. The cost to purple in direct fitness is one sun. The benefit to blue in direct fitness is one sun. Now let's look at indirect cost and benefits. The benefit to purple in indirect fitness is one nephew. The cost to blue in indirect fitness is one nephew. So now are you excited? We're coming up on inclusive fitness. We've got our direct fitness and our indirect fitness and how is this going to work out? Well, let's calculate the inclusive fitness. We find that purple's direct reproductive success declines, but purple's inclusive fitness also declines. We find that blue's direct reproductive success increases, but blue's inclusive fitness also increases. What we found here is that indeed, in this case, purple has behaved altruistically and that altruism has not become cooperation. So what looked like altruism turns out to be altruism. And altruism should be selected against when it's truly altruism, even among close kin. So let's add this up. Uh, the benefit to purple was one nephew, 0.25 units of fitness. The cost to purple was one sun, 0.5 units of fitness. Purple indeed sustained a loss in the inclusive fitness and has the red face now. Well, what about blue? The benefit to blue was one sun, 0.5 units of fitness. The cost was one nephew, 0.25 units of fitness. Blue indeed has gained an inclusive fitness, but purple has lost. In this case, we do have genuine altruism, and rather than expecting that relatives will simply behave this way, what Trivers is arguing is that when this happens, we should expect conflict. So there's space for conflict between siblings. Figuring out what that space is depends on inclusive fitness, and we can say that for cooperation, to replace altruism between full siblings, the benefit has to be greater than twice the cost. Using a famous example that's often used of jumping in the river to save someone as an altruistic act, by this measure you should jump in the river to save three brothers. In doing that, uh, the fitness benefit will be 1.5, and your own life loss will be a loss of 1.0. Uh, but you should stay on the shore if just one brother is drowning because you'll come out behind. So what's an outcome of this? Well, again, sibling rivalry, uh, with which anyone with siblings who are close to the same age is familiar with, uh, can be quite brutal. And this can be related to what's called parent-offspring conflict. And this can happen when parents, in the interest of their own direct fitness, produce more offspring than they can support. And each child that they produce values its own survival higher than that of its sibling. And this is studied in many different species of birds where something called obligate siblicide occurs. This means that there's not enough to go around between the two offspring and generally then, the elder offspring, if it survives, uh, will kill the younger offspring and will end up with only one survivor. 
So fortunately, obligate siblicide did not evolve in humans, uh, but certainly sibling rivalry did. So why would parents do this? Why have too many offspring? Well, one answer is the insurance egg policy. So if that elder chick were to die uh, rather than live, the younger sibling would replace it. So having the two eggs uh, spaced apart so that one is older than the other is like an insurance policy. On the other hand, if the elder chick lives, it will peck to death and kill its younger sibling because there aren't enough resources to go around. And if we look at this, this increases the direct fitness of the parent. But of course, it does this uh, with a considerable amount of cruelty in terms of the death of the one offspring. So the insurance egg policy argues that siblicide in some bird species is a product of parental reproductive strategies called the insurance egg. Now there's also space for conflict between parents and offspring. And this also turns on inclusive fitness. So a selfish sibling uh, might harm, uh, let's say that the sibling is a sister, and still benefit the parent. And so the parent might support that selfish sibling because their own fitness is going to come out ahead by putting their resources into the one sibling rather than the other. Uh, maybe because the first sibling, the selfish one, is going to have more children than the two of them combined would have. And another way to put this is that siblings might not be volunteering to be non-reproductives. Uh, they might have that role of non-reproductive thrust on them uh, by their siblings. So inclusive fitness is not necessarily what we might call fair. Uh, we could have purple harming blue. And as a result, purple benefits. And let's say in this case that these are two siblings and the cost to blue is one son lost, uh, the benefit to purple is two sons. Well, let's look at it from the perspective of a cheery grandparent. And the grandparent has come out ahead here um, because now they have uh, two grandchildren rather than the one. And in terms of purple then replacing blue, uh, that was a selfish act on Purple's part, but because Purple had two offspring and Blue only one, uh, nonetheless, it's a gain from the perspective of, of the grandparents. So conflict reaches into the very heart of the family, uh, where we least expect it, and it extends to the relationship between mothers and their children. So this is, uh, goes against our folk theories about uh, motherly love. But the idea is, uh, based on considerable evidence now, that conflict between the fetus and the mother begins in utero. And basically the fetus is out for what it needs at the expense of the mother. And the mother has a very hard time limiting those resources. So the question is, how much investment should the mother make in the fetus? How much of the energy in her body uh, should be turned over to the fetus? To what degree should the fetus uh, take over her hormonal system and control what her body does? And in some cases, uh, pregnant women develop what's called gestational diabetes. And that occurs when the fetus turns on the blood sugar and the mother can't turn it off. And the fetus does that by the release of hormones into her bloodstream. So this idea of in utero uh, conflict between mother and fetus is now well established. And it shakes us up a bit. But there's other key points of parent-offspring conflict. Uh, one of these is weaning. And usually that's when uh, uh, nursing ends. Uh, when should nursing stop? Often mothers have a different plan than does the offspring. Another key point of conflict is that adolescence, the sexual maturity of offspring. And often parents have a very different idea about when reproduction should start and who the partner should be than do their adolescent children. And lastly, at senescence, this is when the parent then has become a, a a cost to their children. 
Uh, not all grandmas are in shape to help, and some of them need help. And often this occurs just when their children are most pressed with demands to care for their own offspring. And that can lead to conflict between the elderly parent and their adult child over how much is invested in that parent. So these are some of the hard spots in the human life cycle because of limited resources. Thanks for listening.